Okay, so we go now to uh, what we're calling our preliminary tropical storm Ida report. And uh, I'd like to open and then there will be others who will speak and then we'll invite the public to speak. Ida hurt our city very badly so badly that many of us are dispossessed and physically, emotionally, and financially distressed as a result. We as a community share each other's pain and each other's burdens. It's been inspiring to see so many groups and individuals do their best to help their neighbors. From rye relief to laundry ferries to bakers and cooks, bread of life, sports teams, and the volunteers who've helped clean the brook, and especially to all those who've helped and that inevitably I've not mentioned. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. The city too has been doing and will continue to do all it can to help those hurt by Ida. We understand that for many, recovery will be a long haul. The city is here for that long haul. An important step is to understand what happened. Ida was a very special storm, producing nearly nine inches of rain in nine hours, and at peak, raining at an intensity exceeding four inches of rain an hour. Ida, which delivered 50% more rain than Irene, poured its water onto ground still soaked from Storm Henri a week prior. As an experienced U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Engineers manager put it in conversation with us last week, Ida was astounding. Sadly, one can also call Ida deadly, as was the case in Rybrook and elsewhere, and as might have been the case here, if not for the heroic rescue efforts of our fire and police departments and our Department of Public Works. What exactly did Ida do? Ida overwhelmed our ground's ability to hold water, our home stormwater drainage systems, and the storm drains in our streets. The combined effect of all that water from the top of the Blind Blind Brook watershed at Westchester Airport coursed through both branches of Blind Brook, unleashing havoc in Rye Brook and our city. The intense peak flow of the storm ultimately created a flash flood that filled and exceeded our Bowman Dam at great speed. We will devise means to be better prepared for the likes of Ida. But in fact, and as Greg Usry will relate, the city was well prepared for the 44 to 6 inch day of rain that Ida was predicted to be. The city's preparation was tested hard by Ida and though challenged, was not overcome. Some have asked what has been done over past years to protect the city from the flooding problem that's reoccurred for decades. I can speak only to what has been done during my time as mayor. In 2018, upon discovering that our $3 million New York Rising flood mitigation grant was about to expire unused, the city council chose a series of projects, including among other things, data collection mechanisms to allow improved control of our Bowman Dam on Blind Brook, some clearing of brush and debris from our Bowman impoundment area and improved street drainage in a flood prone area adjacent to the boat basin. These projects have moved very slowly and expensively under the administration of the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery and the Dormitory Authority of the State of New York. We are in the process of reconciling status with these two agencies. It's doubtful, however, that if completed, these projects would have changed outcomes in Ida. In 2019, we began flood control talks with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers with the help of Senator Gillibrand's office. It took almost two years, 
but the Corps returned to us recently with a, with a determination that there were sufficient indications of cost beneficial projects in the Blind Brook watershed to permit the Corps to undertake further study that might lead to an actual project with a budget that might approach $15 million. The further study costs would need to be shared by the Corps, the state and the city, as would construction costs in the event of an approved project. The county on its part undertook some renovation work on its impoundments at the top of the Blind Brook watershed that capture Westchester Airport runway stormwater. Some in Rye credited these improved impoundments with diminishing the effect of not Storm Ida, but of Storm Henri. Since Ida, what have we done? We've reached out to Rye Brook, our neighbor controlling most of the watershed above Rye, and begun a conversation involving mayors, managers, and staff about working together on flood control issues in our common watershed going forward. We've had a meeting with the Army Corps and New York State Department of Environmental Conservation on next steps in the Army Corps project process. We've asked our elected officials at all levels of government above the city, the county, state, and federal to help us find the means to tame Blind Brook, diminish risk of street flooding, and advance our harbor dredge plans. What will we do going forward beyond continuing the initiatives above? We will be pursuing FEMA aid for the city itself, as well as helping injured residents access FEMA assistance. We'll ask an augmented flood advisory committee working with the city planner and the city engineer to help us sift the project possibilities identified in the many prior years of studies carried out with a view to choosing and pursuing the most promising with as much speed as these kinds of projects allow. We'll take account of our IDA experience in our master planning process and the allied zoning review, as well as in our contribution to the county hazard management plan and emergency response plan in which we and other municipalities now participate. City staff will continue the initiatives that Greg will outline and we'll be on the watch for more things to make our storm response better. Finally, the city will do all it can to help those injured and displaced by Ida. We'd like to provide immediate relief from the historical problem of flooding in Rye. We will work as quickly as we can, but we will be working with the realities of project planning and funding. We'll hear next from County Legislator Parker. After Catherine, our city manager, Greg Usry, will provide us with important information about Ida and our response. After Greg, we will invite those who wish to speak to do so. Catherine, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you to the council and mayor for giving me an opportunity to address you and the community on flooding. Uh, first, let me start by saying to those of you that experience flooding in your homes or businesses, I extend my heartfelt uh, condolences for what you've gone to through in a way. Um, you know, it has uh, really brought up some of the trauma that I remember 100 year storms within six weeks in 2007 first a five foot uh, five feet of water in the basement uh, March 2nd then seven feet of water uh, April 15th the financial loss that many of you have experienced is frightening the potential for loss of life is frightening after the storms in 2007, I served on the ad hoc flood action task force with Councilwoman Johnson. And I also served on the Rye City Council from 2008 to 2014. 
It was at that time that we did a lot of work to prepare for the next storm. And during that time that we got the sluice for uh, Rye at Bowman Avenue in Rye Brook. In 2014, I started my tenure as a county legislator representing the Sound Shore of Westchester. Flooding is a problem for all of the Sound Shore communities. As many of you heard, Mimaranek and Port Chester were very hard hit during this last storm. Uh, to partner with Mimaranek, for instance, we have often added the Army Corps of Engineers local share to our budget, and we will be doing that again uh, this time, hoping that the project will be moving forward. One of my first pieces of legislation uh, that I passed with the cooperation of my colleagues was the adoption of a, the stormwater reconnaissance plans for the six watersheds of Westchester. This step was an important one to start a process for the county's stormwater advisory board to evaluate requests from municipalities for a match of county funding for flood mitigation. A matching commitment of money. So if Rye is putting in $3 million to a project, the county would put in $3 million, uh, can really make all the difference. Uh, strangely, and not something that I think anyone on this council uh, has anything to do with or can answer, but Rye hesitated uh, taking that first step to qualify for funding, um, going back before anybody who's sitting on the dais was serving. Uh, the first step was a, there needed to be a submission to the county of answers to our questionnaire outlining the extent of flooding and a list of capital projects that would mitigate. Uh, we did finally receive that information in July of 2016, but no request for funding came afterwards. In 2018, things started to change. And at the request of Flood Chair Bernie Altoff, the Rye Rising Task Force, and I believe this council, uh, I helped to get a meeting with the New York Rising Regional Director and our key personnel for Westchester County to discuss expanding the two retention ponds at Westchester County Airport. The county was quick to act, and we finished its resizing of the retention ponds at Westchester County Airport in 2019. I checked in with our Director of Operations, for the airport to find out about how that resizing had operated during the most recent storm. And he told me that those retention ponds never crested during tropical storm Ida. 2018 was also the year that my colleagues and I working with the county executive and our state and federal delegation had to learn about the Army Corps of Engineers proposal for floodgates just below Pelham Bay and Long Island Sound that would surely have had adverse effects to coastal communities north. The Army Corps of Engineers had proposed the storm surge barriers to protect northern Bronx communities, but for those in Westchester, this could have been an additional problem for wildlife and potentially could have led to more coastal flooding. Due to our work, this project has been taken off the fast track by the federal government, and we will continue to be vigilant. On Monday, Mayor Cohen, I received your letter, which was sent to all of your elected partners in county, state, and federal government. And I'm eager to see the county help pay, pay um, for flood mitigation with Rye. Once this council has identified a project and cost estimates for design, we can look at adding it to the county budget. The county executive will be uh, giving his proposed capital budget to the Board of Legislators for a review on October 8th. That's very, uh, very quick. Um, but there's another opportunity for the 2022 budget um, before we pass the budget at our first meeting in December. I agree with you, Mayor Cohen, real solutions will need support, not just of the county, but also New York State and our federal government. And as Mayor Cohen knows, I reached out to our Congressman Jamal Bowman and asked him to come to Rye. He toured with the mayor and myself to see the devastation experienced by so many of our neighbors. And as he's still learning about his congressional district, I felt this was a much needed important step to making sure that Rye's request for federal funds would be treated as a must have and not a nice to have. Mm -hmm. Lastly, as I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, the potential for loss of life is frightening and it's real. 11 residents in Queens lost their life drowning in their apartments. 
Westchester was lucky that that didn't happen here, but we need more than luck. I have submitted to the Board of Legislators this past Monday evening proposed legislation to mandate property owners that have had flood, flooded premises due to the overflow of natural waters, say inland or tidal waters, unusual and rapid accumulation of runoff or surface waters, for example, um, for both residential and commercial spaces that prior to the signing of a lease that that information is ex disclosed. The dates going back 10 years to when floods occurred and where the water line was estimated to be. If they do not disclose, it could trigger a civil action to recover monies for lost property. We will be starting committee meetings next week and we'll set a public hearing in about four weeks. I thank you all for your time this e evening and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I, I have one. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, I know we talked in the days after the flood and, and all with what more can we do, right? So thank you for everything that you're doing and will continue to do terrific partner. Um, I wanted to ask about the resizing of the Westchester County Airport retention ponds and, and make sure I understood, I'm taking notes, um, you're saying it did not crest during Ida. That is correct. The ponds did not crest at Westchester County Airport. So, so Catherine, would, were there more? Because I, I remember at one point there was talk of having a retention pond built, I think, near SUNY Purchase. Would that have, ha I mean, do you think that having more retention ponds in the county and strategic places would help, especially because we're downstream, right? We're at the end of it all. It all, everything comes down our way. If there's more retention upstream, it takes the pressure off of us at the bottom of it all. Is right. that anywhere in discussion, creating more or, or resizing other ones that do exist? Well, that would be, so, so SUNY Purchase is a, is a state entity so that would be um, a conversation I wouldn't necessarily be privy to and certainly want maybe one for um, your uh, staff and, and your state officials. The, but the, I agree uh, with you that additional retention ponds would be a good thing. The, the purchase I idea is one of the things that the core has preliminarily focused on. Okay, so... Uh, before we open to the public, uh, Greg, please. Right. So I'm going to let me start with. I'm going to share my screen here. Everybody see that? You uh, yes. Okay. All right. So. What I'd like to do tonight, although it's, you know, it's been three long weeks, um, I, I, I want to hit the highlights or I want to go over, first of all, the, the magnitude of the storm, because I think that as, as we've all either witnessed anecdotally or heard, um, this was a storm of historic proportions. And so I think the first thing I want to do is just kind of based on um, accurate weather information, kind of review what the magnitude of the storm was and then move into what the magnitude of the damage was, where it occurred, what the city's response was, and most important of all, what are the lessons we've learned and what are we, what are we've already started doing and, and will be doing in the, in the months ahead. So by way of background, um, Ida, as we all know, was a hurricane hitting the coast of uh, Louisiana and, and Florida on or about August 29th. It reached Westchester County in the Northeast and Rye, on September 1st. On the 31st, the National Weather Service did issue a, a flash flood warning for Rye in the vicinity. Um, but at that time and up through the morning of the 1st, the rainfall projection was four to six inches for a period that was gonna last of approximately 12 hours. Now, that was in fact what Rye and the Sound Shore community and the immediate area, including New Jersey and Southern New York um, did prepare for. What we actually received was something very, very different. Um, beginning on Wednesday evening at approximately seven o'clock, the intensity of the rain increased significantly. And I'll show you in a minute um, what that really resulted in. We reached a maximum accumulation of, of a little under four inches in an hour um, and over six inches in a three hour period. As you see below how that compares to Henri and, and Irene. So 
you know, one of the things to keep in mind is what this storm actually carried versus what was seen in, in prior storms. This was not a wind storm. It was not coastal flooding. It was sheer velocity and volume of rain in an extraordinarily short period of time. Greg, we're not seeing, I'm not seeing any change on the screen past your title page. All right. Still there? Nothing? Title page. Oh, that's a problem. All right. Let me see if I can share this again. I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought I had. Hold on one second. Technical problem. So. Go to file. Go to top left. Yeah. Give me one second. Let's see if Kristen or I can pull it up from over here. Okay. All right, I'm going to send this to someone else because it's it's clearly not working on my screen. So my apologies. best laid technological plans here. So I'm going to send it, I, I've gone on and sent it over. I'm going to um, give some more of the highlights and we'll go back into the slides as soon as uh, they've arrived. Um, the Ida rainfall um, accumulated at over two and a half inches in a 30 minute period, accumulated four inches of rain in an hour period, almost five inches of rain in 90 minutes and almost six and a half inches of rain in two and a half hours. The total rainfall all occurred between 8 p.m. and 2 a.m. By 2 a.m. in the morning, the rain had completely stopped. Um, the significant accumulation all occurred between 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. 
that's when we had all, um, that's when we had almost four inches of rain. As important was just the, the sheer velocity, meaning that there were periods of time during that 90 minutes when the equivalent rainfall during five and 10 minute periods, which is, which is, was as much as nine was, would have been the equivalent of nine inches an hour. So there were moments in time when the velocity of the rain was, you know, was, a, was of that kind of magnitude. In terms of overall storm impact, um, the citywide flooding occurred for two primary reasons. Number one was the flooding resulting from the Blind Brook and the Beaver Swamp Brook. That's both in terms of volume and velocity. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Maybe more importantly or, or more concerning was just the widespread flooding due to the overwhelmed catch basins and stormwater management system. But I do emphasize this was both at the city level, but also for individual residences. Stormwater management for homes with the gutter systems, the downspouts, the French drains, the dry wells and the like, sump pumps just could not keep up with this volume of rain in, in such a short period of time. The Bowman Avenue Dam spillway and dam overflowed, um, flooding the businesses in the traditional Blind Brook area um, all the way down. Um, none of this due to coastal flooding or tidal flooding, but rather just the volume of water that went over the dam and, and the spillway. Um, we did have approximately 770 power outages. None of that was due to wind. That was all due to fallen trees or um, mostly because of the, uh, just the water accumulation and, the, and, and tree falling. Those were, for the most part, restored by the evening of September 2nd, and everything was restored by the, um, by the afternoon of September 3rd. There was no wind damage that we could find, and there was no coastal flooding. So this was all a rain event. And I'll get this, I want to get this chart up in a second, but the, the other important aspect or one of the important aspects was the flooding that occurred at Bowman Dam. We have historically done site visits to the dam during storm events, um, either every 30 minutes or every hour, um, therefore monitoring what was going on behind the dam and the accumulation of water. Between 9.45 and 10.45 that evening, the water level increased by 15 feet in a little bit less than an hour. So between 9.45 and approximately 10.35, the water reached the spillway. That was about 12 and a half feet. There we go. Looks like we may have a, a presentation now. Uh, Greg, I have your PowerPoint up. So you just tell me when to go to the next slide. And I okay. Let's go, go down. Uh, four, four or five slides now, Kristen. That's Keep one. Going. One more. Actually, two more. I want to go to the water level. Uh, that one? No. Uh, You're missing the slide. <laughs> Wonderful. It's titled Water Level at Bowman Dam. I don't even see it in there, Kristen. This is the PowerPoint, and I believe two of Eric's slides could not all right, well, this is one of them. This is the important one. I'm not sure why you don't have it. All right, so the point, the point being that we had um, 15 feet of accumulation in the water level at the dam in less than an hour. So we were, in fact, there was a police officer that checked the dam at approximately 9.30 to 9.40. We had 12 feet of clearance to the spillway, 15 clearance to the top of the dam, and 55 minutes later, it crested the dam. Is this the uh, water level one? That's it. Okay. All right. Incidentally, this entire slideshow has been posted on the website for anybody that wants to go back and refer to it later. It is under the Ida tab, and there is a um, the, the entire slideshow is there. So my, my apologies for my uh, technical issues here tonight. So this is to show, shows the water accumulation. This is in five minute increments at the bottom to, to give you an idea of how quickly that was changing. And Greg, what is, I'm, I have glasses. 
uh, does that say 44 feet and then it goes up to 58? No, higher, 59? Oh, 57. So the top of the spill, this is, this is elevation level starting with a base of 44 feet above sea level. That's, that's, that's the brook coming into the dam. Okay. All right. The spillway is 55 feet. All right. So you have 11 and a half feet from a normal level to the top of the spillway and then another two feet to the top of the dam. So that's, so the point is between 945 and 1055, you had a 15 foot change. Greg, do, do we have, have, have we seen anything like this before? Not in anyone's memory that I've spoken to. Um, no, I mean, the accumulation, and I'll put it this way, when we, during Henri, the week ahead of time, we had, uh, you know, water rising during the peak of the storm by about three feet, three and a half feet in one hour. And that was at the height of the storm when we got, I think, uh, six tenths of an inch in an hour. Um, but nothing of this kind of magnitude. It literally was like a flash flood coming over the top of the dam. Okay, Kristen, why don't you go to the next one? And just, just another question, Greg. This, the sluice gate was closed throughout this. That's correct, yes. Now, what I wanted to do a little bit to demonstrate the magnitude of the flooding and why this was so unusual is this is the um, flood map that, um, that actually is a, it's a county production, but this shows the historic, the 100-year floodplain, the FEMA 100-year floodplain, the FEMA 500-year floodplain, coastal and then tidal wetlands. Generally speaking, everyone in the floodplain was flooded. What was extraordinary and unusual about this storm, and that you'll see we added at the, toward the bottom of that key, the additional flooded areas. Those light blue areas were flooded beyond the 100-year floodplain. And if you'll, you'll notice the long line going into Port Chester, that's all of, of uh, Forest Avenue and Midland, parts of Midland. You'll notice parts of Kirby Lane, You'll notice parts of Hicks Park. You'll notice areas in Greenhaven. Part of this was due to the, the additional flooding in, um, along the Blind Brook and, and Beaver, but it also demonstrates some of the widespread flooding that was occurring just because of the sheer volume in which the city stormwater system could not handle. The flooding dissipated, but for those who had homes where their driveway or their garage elevation was below the grade of the, of the street, the water accumulation was just literally running down the fronts of, of driveways. Um, and in the case of some running so deep, it was literally higher than the elevation of the street going on the side streets and then down into garages. So it just sheer accumulation of water. Um, and that, you know, I, it really affected us almost citywide unless you were at the highest elevations. To just uh, to clarify for me, you've said that everything in the 100-year floodplain was flooded and then some. Is correct. that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't survey every home in the floodplain, but generally speaking, our experience and in, in our review is everything in the floodplain and then all of those blue areas that would not have traditionally ever flooded. And we, we didn't have tidal surge flooding, and we didn't have tidal surge on the coast. Did we have coastal flooding? Not, not that we, that's been reported. I mean, I can't speak that there's not you know, individual homes that didn't get flooded because of the stormwater system, but there was no tidal surge and there was no traditional tidal flooding. Okay, so when we refer to the 100-year flood plain, we're referring to that around Blind Brook. Right, it's the non, I, I should have clarified, it's the non-tidal related 100-year flood plain, but yes. Okay. Right, that was going to be my question too. Right. So along the coast here, presumably those 
properties were not as affected or minimally affected because it was not a coastal event. Right. Un- un- unless, unless it would have been storm water drain or storm water system right. related, but there was no, we did not have water, you know, coming from, you know, uh, tidal change coming up Milton, you know, coming along the coast, Pine Island, coming along um, the nursing Island and, and the like, as it, as it normally would have at this, I mean, I'll, and, you know, in the case of Henri, we did get some of that, for example. That's because Henri probably had more wind. It's usually the wind uh, that causes more of the coastal flooding because it exacerbates that storm surge. Um, And Henri, we did have a a tidal flood warning that accompanied the storm. In this case, it was just a flash flood warning. There There was no tidal flood warning. There was no watch. All right, Kristen, can you go to the next one? So at a very high level, just to, to, in terms of scoping what the damage was, not that anybody on Zoom or on the council hasn't seen it. In terms of city property damage, we did lose the entire first floor of the Locust Avenue firehouse. Um, we did have flooding in the basement, albeit not high, but some you know, flooding on the, in the basement of City Hall. We did have some minor damage and loss of dockage, a couple of the fingers at the boat basin. We did have damage, although we've not fully assessed it at the Theodore from wall adjacent to the back of car park. I guess that's three um, along Theodore from, which was and has already been part of a rebuild going back to Sandy, I guess. Um, We did have damage to some of the city streets. Uh, I think the, 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 the most obvious or the, the most easily seen is that um, in front of on Purchase Street, in front of uh, the arcade building, where you'll see some of the streets collapsed. Um, but that that is citywide. We did also have some minor damage. We hope or believe at, at the Bowman Avenue Dam. Um, I can't tell you right now. It looks like it's cosmetic and some wiring, but um, we do have that under review. Um, and that's that's the major you know city based damage. Damages to business, it's por- uh, as we all know, portions of the central business district related to Blind Brook. So, you know, Elm, the, uh, I guess that's the southwest side of, of, uh, of, of Purchase Street. Um, some of the most visible damage to the YMCA, the whole first basement of the, of the Rye Free Reading Room. And then in terms of residential damage, um, nearly every resident in the Beaver Swamp and Blind Brook non-tidal flood zones. And then we had that additional dimension, and that is citywide flooding. I call it localized, but localized in those areas related to the stormwater system that was just overwhelmed, where you had the homes with, you know, first floor flooding or garages below grade, um, where the water just funneled in. Okay, Kristen? Before getting into lessons learned, I just I want to hit some high points of, of the city preparation and then some of the um, emergency actions and then go into kind of what we're looking at going forward. Um, beginning on the 31st with the, the storm warning, uh, the, the flood warning and the, and the forecast, we did do um, our normal storm preparations. Um, we did do our first flood warning message was sent out as a code red and on the listserv. Um, on the 31st, DPW in regular order prior to these storms um, does, you know, we do have certain catch basins in certain areas that are problematic, whether because of debris, regular debris, and they did go around on the 31st and service those problematic catch basins just to make sure they were clear. There were some that were cleared in the aftermath of Henri um, that were um, noted and they were, those were inspected and cleared. In terms of public works staffing, we held over the fire department, police department, and we put DPW workers on standby in preparation for, this, for the storm. Um, in terms of staffing, and this really was not pre, but during the storm, the period between 5 p.m. on the 1st and midnight, uh, or 12 p.m. rather, on the 2nd, you'll see our staffing there. DPW, that's basically 100% staffing during that period of time, police department, that probably represents 
75 percent are a total police department and the fire department was effectively fully staffed during that period if you look at that 18 hour you know uh, period prior to the storm as we normally do public works vehicles were prepped with cleanup equipment chainsaws things prepared to do storm clearing and also barricades, stop signs and the like um, to deal with um, flooding during the storm. Um, the, uh, the, the midday on the first, we did uh, request a, a Con Ed liaison as we typically do. That was a remote um, liaison during the storm. And then they were on site at 7 a.m. at police headquarters the morning of the second. But as I said, you know, the, the issue was not wind and typically the widespread power outages but uh, much more of the storm. We did uh, establish an emergency shelter. Um, it was somewhat ad hoc at police headquarters at 1 a.m. Um, on the night of the storm. Um, it was ultimately moved to Damiano and we used buses or vans to transport 40 individuals from the police headquarters that had been displaced by the storm to the Damiano Center um, until they could make arrangements to go family, friends, or otherwise. And then we did, um, as we normally do, um, and then as the storm approached, we established the Emergency Operations Center at police headquarters. In terms of the overall response, um, believe, believe between police, fire, and public works, we responded to 500 or approximately 500 emergency assistance calls. There were approximately 30 evacuation rescues from homes, installed cars, and there were four individuals who were actually pulled from, from the water. Um, unlike any other storm, at least that I've been told in the history of the city, Public Works actually was, in, in addition, not that they were always willing to do this, but Public Works staff was actually assisting in rescues because there was a period of time where we had um, a, more than half of our police rescue um, personnel were on the opposite side of of uh, High Street, or rather of um, Highland, and the water was running so hard, unable to get over, that uh, we had actually public works staff that was working on rescues as well. Um, evacuated residents were housed at police headquarters, as I said, and then overnight were transported to Rye Rec. Um, we did use both the listserv and Code Red on a regular basis beginning at 8 a.m. on the morning of the 2nd. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, code red overnight on the first in a minute, but you know we were trying to use every available act uh, way to get to residents. Um, you know uh, during you know during the time of the storm. Why don't you go next, Kristen, please? In terms of the post storm cleanup and assistance, um, beginning on really starting immediately after the rain stopped around two a.m. Public Works began removing uh, debris, first from catch basins, and then moving as quickly as they could to residents. To date, we, they have removed approximately 750 tons of debris related to the storm. Um, that is, those are not trees. Those are, unfortunately, all of the, you know, the damaged possessions, all of the, the muck out um, from, you know, from homes. Uh, 48 abandoned and submerged cars were first of all cleared from city streets to allow passing and then ultimately were, uh, were removed completely. Um, we did receive a handful of safety and wellness um, uh, concerns from residents and in coordination with the County Health Department and the Red Cross, the, public, uh, the police department did do wellness checks and that actually continued up until a few days ago. Um, we did arrange for, or we did, we were contacted by the, the Red Cross and we did um, provide for and, and make available cleanup kits for residents um, as provided by the Red Cross. And then beginning within a, a day of the storm, two days of the storm, we provided, began providing um, FEMA information to homeowners and businesses. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute as well. Um, subject to council action on the agenda tonight, retroactive to last week, permit fees for storm damage repairs were waived. Um, the city planner began last Thursday doing twice weekly planning a series for residents on related to rebuilding the city permit process, waterproofing homes, um, and the like. And those are those have been done 
are being done twice a week still. Um, the YMCA did reach out and is coordinating with Rye Rec to, as well as the, the uh, schools to move some of their programming and daycare to um, Damiano. And uh, we've been working with them and the county uh, health department to, to make our facilities available for, for the YMCA to use, you know, to the best that, the best that we can. Um, you know, one thing I do want to note, and I know that there have been efforts across the city to assist with the library, to assist with the YMCA, to assist uh, neighbors. Um, I also want, I think it's important to recognize that the, the efforts of a, a number of, of residents and working, frankly, on behalf or with the city on cleanup. Um, Tracy Stora, Ryan Prime, Christine Siller, a whole host of volunteers did um, work last week in helping us to clean out the blind brook to begin getting some of the, 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 the debris there that has continued um, through the boat basin sur- super uh, uh, personnel as well as, as, as DPW. But, but um, you know, Tracy did yeoman's work in, in, in a coordinated effort with the county and, and a number of volunteers to, to get some of that initial cleanup done. And I know that, you know, that was being done across the city. So, you know, thanks to all for that. Uh, next, please. I know that there's uh, ongoing conversations and has been uh, or concern or questions about the New York Rising projects. I do want to give you just a quick update, and I know that this will be uh, there'll be more of this in, in the days ahead. Um, as an unf- well, as a, as a coincidence of everything that was going on, uh, the New York Rising actually bid the three projects um, and have awarded bids in the last couple of weeks. Um, there's actually a pre-construction meeting tomorrow um, related to the drainage system at on Milton Road. The other two projects, which is the stream gauge installation um, and the tree clearing at, uh, at the pond, um, those awards will be made um, in the next six weeks. Construction is scheduled to begin before the end of the year, and all three projects are scheduled to have project completion by June of, of 2022. So um, that is, that's, that's where we are with the New York Rising projects. Is this, this, did this come on the heels? I mean, this stuff has been sitting there forever. We've been bugging DASNY to, to move on this stuff. Do we, so I have two questions. One, is this just coincidental that they started moving? And number two, do we have a, um, level of confidence that they'll be able to move at this pace that's detailed here, given how long they've been sitting on, on moving these projects? Well, Julie, I mean, I guess the, the, the first question, um, it is, an, it, I will say unfortunate coincidence. It is a coincidence. Um, the, the, uh, we've been, I mean, you know, Kristen and I actually, as even as recently as yesterday, we're trying to finish up some of the, um, you know, some of the legal requirements um, related to the Milton drainage itself. But in terms of the, the, the construction, uh, the, the projects were put out for bids about, I want to say maybe six weeks ago. So it just by coincidence did happen that everything has kind of come to a head now. Um, there is a great deal of urgency to the projects, both by DASNY and GOSOR and by the city because the HUD funding has to be closed out by fall, I think it's September of 2022. And there is a period that they, they, uh, that GOSER needs um, prior to the completion of, of, the, of, the, uh, of each project. So um, there is a, certainly a sense of urgency. I am being told by DASNY that this construction schedule is, is reasonable and attainable, um, but that's, that's as much as I can, I can tell you. So my one concern then is these construction bids were done, you know, pre-storm and now everybody's having trouble finding construction resources, right, to rebuild and all of that. So I just, you know, I would, this would be great if we could get this moving. And and so forgive my skepticism, but we've given how, how, I mean, this is years, literally years. We approved this years ago. And the fact that they've been sitting on it, and and I'm glad it's finally moving, but I just, I hope that there is a tremendous amount of pressure. I know we will be relaying it, but on DASNY to move this forward and meet these deadlines because because we just have to, we can't afford this to to wait. 
Agreed. Greg, and, and what is your uh, view on the awards that are supposed to be given out in the next six weeks in the, uh, not the Milton Project, but the other two? What's your level of confidence? Well, we, the, the, the level of confidence, I hate being on record saying my personal level of confidence, the, 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 tr the tree clearing at Bowman Pond received, I believe, five or six bids. Um, you know, I, I, I know that DASNY has a process for vetting to make sure that, you know, the, the, the whoever they award to is, uh, is up to the task, so to speak. Um, I'm told that's going to happen in the next several weeks. On um, the installation of the screen gauge received one bid. Um, and I know that they are in conversations with that, or I'm told they're in conversations with that bidder. So, um, I mean, this is, this is certainly on the front of my plate, our plate collectively. Um, and, you know, we will, we will report as much as we can as soon as we get information from them. I, there's not, there's at this point, there's not a day that goes by that um, either Kristen, Ryan, or myself are not on the phone with, or in conversations with someone from either Ghost or Dasney. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly occupying a lot of our time as well right now. So we're trying to move it as quickly as we can. Subject to Dazzling. All right, Kristen. Um, from my standpoint, um, you know, with all that as the background, the most important thing for the city, in my view, is immediate action items related to what we learned three weeks ago. And I know that there's a lot of things related to flooding and flood response that will take longer to institute. What doesn't take long in institute are things we learned from an emergency preparedness standpoint. <clears throat> um, there were a lot of things that happened that uh, there were a lot of successes in our response to this storm that were really as a result of the amazing work being done by police, fire, and public works, but in a situation that, that none of us have seen before and they have not seen before. And what is important for all of us is to take what we witnessed and experienced and, and, and formulate that into a plan um, that will be for any size storm, but particularly for an occurrence like what we just had. Um, one of the first items is, is a continued review and update of our communication system. Um, one of the real problems that we had in the storm and we have with any storm is our inability to have targeted announcements. We don't have a system that can target a particular area of town, a particular street, the business district, or anything else. And we are going to be moving by before the end of the year to a city app that will allow us to communicate with those registered to particular areas of town. So if I want, not I, if the city needs to communicate a message to Milton Point that's different from what it is, um, in the downtown business district, we will be able to do that. And I think that the way in which we're um, communicating with the residents, particularly during emergencies, is going to be critical. Um, we have been throughout this year through Nicole's work, we are continuing to revise the way that we approach communications. We're going to continue doing that, um, possibly adding additional social media outlets. Right now, we're just on Instagram. Um, whether looking at Facebook or something else. But again, um, streamlining how we are communicating and what we're communicating with our residents, because there's, as I've learned from this experience in the last several storms, there's that fine line between continuing to pepper people with information that becomes somewhat numbing and actually getting across real emergency directives or information that, that people need to be aware of. So that's something that is certainly foremost in, in my plans and the city's plans for the remainder of this year. Um, one of the things that we learned from this experience is that at its height, our ability to dispatch police, fire, and then public works became problematic. There was some short-term power outages, but just sheer having the volume of people on the roads that we did, um, we are, um, and this is something that Mike and Fuso John McDwyer and, and, and Ryan Corner are already working on is establishing a way of having what I call a virtual emergency operations center. 
so that if we have supervisors that are in the field, that they're not having to go through 60 control of the county, that they're not having to solely rely on going through the front desk at the police department, but we're actually able to dispatch people in the field between supervisors so that we can get people in the right place at the right time. And that's, that is already in, in the works. Um, Mike Infuso has already registered a, a group of both fire and police officers to take advanced flash flood tr rescue training. We, are, we have always been trained in water rescues, but given the nature of the storm, what we learned is that, you know, rescues in flat, I'll keep calling flash floods, but in the volume of, of water that we had coming down the Blind Brook, it's a very different thing. And so um, we're going to have a, a hybrid group of, between police and fire that will be trained specifically in that rescue. And that's, that is, again, already on the, underway. One of the uh, things I've already, that I pointed out earlier was the magnitude of the accumulation at Bowman Dam in such a short period of time. We clearly cannot rely any longer on sending a police officer or a public works officer periodically to the dam to look at water levels. So we are going to be installing and utilizing additional monitoring devices at the dam. Um, one of the things I also want to do, and this probably will be working with other jurisdictions in the county, is to figure out if there's a way to add monitoring or at least the relay of information of what's going on upstream because right now we don't have any access to that information. And, I, and obviously for this storm and potentially for future ones, we wanna have that. A minor item that, well, I say minor in expense, but would have been helpful. We don't have enough flat bottom small boats for water rescues in town. And it's not a big expense, it's not a big item, but what we did learn is that we did not have um, enough of that resource. And so we will be moving very quickly on procuring, and I call them rescue boats. These are not big ticket items. These are small aluminum flat bottom boats that we can get into streets where we need to get into to assist in rescues. We were fortunate that we, and I, I say took advantage of the police headquarters and namely the court facilities for an evacuation site. That's not something that's ideal. It's not something that's appropriate. Um, we will be for, for beginning shortly having a designated evacuation site, um, not just staffed, but also supplied. So we were scrambling for blankets, we were scrambling for supplies, and that's not, gonna, that's not appropriate going forward. So we are going to have, whether it's at Damiano or some other site, we will be designating a regular evacuation site for residents to go to, but also for our emergency staff to be able to deliver people to and in a, in a situation like this or snowstorm or anything else. Um, as I talked about before, we are trying our best to move ahead and make as painless as possible the process for um, permit applications and also just the application process. Christian uh, Miller and the building department staff are prioritizing all building uh, permits as it relates to rebuilding um, repairs and the like, and that's both with uh, residences as well as uh, businesses. Um, one of the things that we have already started to do um, in the last week is that we know that there are areas of town that have systematic stormwater problems. Um, you know, unfortunately, those places were significantly exacerbated by this rainfall. And so we are in the process and have already identified a number of those. Um, Ryan and I started meeting with some of those residents this week, and we'll continue doing that. Um, I can't promise instant results, but what we are going to be doing is systematically looking at all of those areas, doing some initial review, some initial scoping of the problem, and seeing if that can result in either sizing um, you know, a financial outcome, a, a structural outcome. Um, but, but, we, but we know we have some areas in town that need to be addressed and, um, you know, and we're committed to doing that. Greg, could I ask a question, a couple things on this. So, you know, one area for instance, is that we've talked about, um, you know, is, is some of these pipes are older pipes and perhaps more narrow, like on Midland Road, which is a county road. So those are the sorts of things you would probably identify in this last bullet. And so then my question is, 
where where it's county property, this is where I'm assuming we could work with Catherine to help get those things prioritized and budgeted, as she was saying, in November, I think there's a November deadline, which I don't know if we could pull some of this together by then to get, get sneak it in the budget there. That would be amazing. And if not, at least get on the docket for the next budget cycle. Um, and then in addition, those matching funds that she talked about, if we can do, you know, projects that will, um, you know, for stormwater mitigation, as we identify these to get those matching funds in the instances where, where, you know, it's under, you know, the city can fund at least half of it, right? So I'm assuming the output of this action item is a list of those sort of maybe ranked priorities and then working with the county and all the way up to get those things funded? That, that's correct. I mean, we know, for example, we know that the intersection or the vicinity around Peck and Midland is a problem. And that's, and that's actually been a, 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 a greater issue um, even starting, I mean, prior to Henri, but certainly Henri and the and the Yeah. Island. Can I ask about so, that? So, so what we, we don't know yet whether this is because of last mile. We don't know whether it's because of block county pipes. We don't know what it is yet. Catherine has already taken the initiative to setting up a, a meeting with the county, and we're, we're, we're starting that process. I, but I, wanted, I also want to be transparent and upfront with everybody. Um, we're going to start with Cameroon lines. We're going to start with the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, to make sure that what's there, we're aware, we, we know what the, the diameter of the pipes are, we know things that are clear, we know the catch basins are working in order, and see whether there are things that we can be doing on a remedial basis. Um, you know, things like stormwater line replacement is a, is a, is a huge undertaking. And, I'm, and I, I just want to be upfront with people that this is not something that's going to happen in the next 90 days. This is going to be a longer process. What I'm, but what I'm telling you is that we are going to prioritize, Julie, to your point, the places where we see systematic ongoing flooding issues around storm, the stormwater system and prioritizing those first and seeking funding and seeking solutions to the best that we can. I think, I think that's absolutely terrific. And I, and I think this, this sort of uh, timeline of, of, you know, emergency response measures, you know, whether it comes to having to get uh, additional rescue boats, which with the increase in um, these extreme storm events, uh, sadly, we are uh, probably going to need um, even more of um, the uh, prioritization. I know I'm going to sound like a broken record of uh, stormwater um, measures so that we have, um, you know, first and foremost on the mind is, is prevention um, in addition to emergency response, but the prevention so that we can help mitigate. Obviously, it's not going to eliminate the, the, the flooding, but, uh, you know, the green infrastructure uh, elements that we can potentially add, whether it's um, bioswales in municipal parking lots, or you know, when we're uh, looking to repave roads, um, adding in rain gardens and you know other uh, stormwater mitigation measures. There's funding for that, and I'm wondering if there's a way uh, to incorporate green infrastructure into our CIP as, um, as a section so that we have um, a, an ability to identify those areas um, as we move forward, um, either in the short term, you know, these are, the, these are the areas of our city that really demand attention now, but we also need to consider these other areas or these other um, types of green infrastructure pro uh, um, uh, projects, you know, on a five, 10 year or, a, you know, uh, long term basis. So um, th this concept of a stormwater prevention um, program, I think, is is uh, is one that obviously the city can do from an operational perspective. Um, and obviously, you know, I would hope that going forward, the council will consider um, from a policy perspective as well. I think that the, uh, the green infrastructure addendum is a great idea. All right, Kristen, I'm not sure what we've got after this. 
There we go. Um, the, the last thing I want to leave you with, and this will transition to um, someone from the SBA. Um, if for anybody, any residents that are watching tonight, um, the thing I would tell you more than anything else is if you've had any damage to your property, and this is both for residents as well as for businesses, there is a deadline for, fi for not filing, but registering with FEMA of, no of November 4th. Um, that doesn't mean you have to have your paperwork done. It doesn't have to mean that everything is completed, but you have to be registered by November 4th. Um, that is for individual assistance. Um, there is also under the SBA an ability to get loans. This is both for individuals as well as for businesses. The information is here. Everything you see on the screen is on the city's website. On the first page, you go to the IDA banner at the top. You'll find all of this information, all of the links to where you go for FEMA, where you go for the SBA, where the assistance centers are located, what their hours are. Um, all of those links you know, are, are there. Um, the, other, the other information that is there is related to um, the city permit process and, the, and rather the, um, the planning meetings that Christian is putting on, as well as this presentation that unfortunately no one was able to see the first four pages of. That's all posted as well. My apologies for that. Um, but that's, that is, we're, we're trying to make, I think of everything you, I've done tonight, this page to me is the most important because this is the one that is going to assist people in getting the, the most assistance they can get. You have to go through your insurance company first, but please register now just um, to get the ball rolling. Greg, we have someone from SBA with us. Yes, Nicole, if you can elevate um, Liliana, I believe, I'm hoping she's still here. Let's see. And uh, see me? Yep, we can see uh, from the nose up. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Well, good evening. Um, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Craig, thank you so much for the invitation tonight to come speak, um, you know, at the City Council. It was very short notice, and I really appreciate Craig and, and the staff that, uh, you know, me, met me today at the City Hall. Um, I'm one of the public affairs specialists that represents Small Business Administration, Office of Disaster Assistance, um, and I'm here on the ground to represent um, Small Business Administration with disaster assistance loans for businesses and homeowners and renters that they were actually affected by Hurricane Ida. So as you all know, a presidential declaration was signed in um, that includes the, the time of September 1st to September 3rd uh, and the damages that occurred. That presidential declaration number is New York 17147. Not that it matters to anybody, but it might help a lot of people in the application process if they file online. But as uh, Greg mentioned, this is a deadline, and because of um, any disaster assistance loans that's available or disaster assistance in general that has a timeline. And the registration timeline um, for FEMA, for registering, it's, it's November 4th, and it's also our uh, deadline for applying for physical damage loans. The physical damage loans, it's just like the name says, you know, it's to repair and replace, you know, physical damage to your businesses or your property. Um, and, you know, it could be for businesses of all sizes to repair, you know, uh, real estate inventory and equipment that they lost throughout the process of the storm. And they could be for businesses alone up to $2 million with an interest rate as low as 2.8. Um, uh, eight five five percent for businesses, two percent for nonprofit organization, and um, you know they could apply for physical damage. The good uh, news about it is that on top of the physical damage uh, assistant loans, that it's also economic injury loans. So businesses that they were in the area, they had no physical damage to their property or to their real estate, they could apply for what they call an economic injury disaster assistant loan. That is um, the deadline for that. It is June 6th of 2022, and uh, they need to be in business for six months prior to the disaster. They need to prove that they were in existence before that time, that they are, you know, that their physical, um, uh, even if their physical damage was not there, that they need to prove that economic damage was there. 
So uh, those loans are up to $2 million and they are, you know, very low interest rate with 30 years repayment note and uh, 18 months of deferment. Um, I'm going to have all that information and Craig posted it already on the website. I'm going to have on Friday um, a short uh, TV um, interview with the city, and I'm just going to post a little bit more information on that. But what I'd like to answer uh, to to uh, stress out is that we, as SBA, we are open to disaster recovery um, areas, and we call it business recovery areas in uh, in um, White Plains at the Power Authority building, and it was. Uh, opened yesterday at nine o'clock. They're going to be open from nine to five a.m., um, nine nine a.m. to five p.m. And um, you know, businesses, business owners, they could come directly to us. They don't need to register with FEMA for a disaster assistance loan. And we have another location in Queens, um, and with the same you know uh, schedule. But every disaster recovery um, operation that's headed by FEMA. And there are eight uh, locations open, one in village of Mamaroneck, one in the city of Yonkers that's closer to your city. And they are staffed with SBA people so they could come to those disaster you know, recovery centers and they could start the application process. Um, with that being said, I hope that I brought a little bit of uh, hope and, and um, you know, um, you know, let's say um, assistance to, to your city. And I'm sorry for what you had to be through. Um, I see many disasters. I'm deployed every time when a disaster happens um, throughout the United States. And uh, the pictures that I've seen from the flooding, uh, they're tremendous. I have never seen something like that before of a magnitude for something that it was uh, shortly announced. And with that being said, um, I just hope that, you know, you could get that information and uh, put it out to the networks um, available to you and just spread the news. And thank you so much for the time and for the, you know, hospitality. Thank you. Josh, just for um, this information has been shared with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I think Greg has shared it. I have shared it. So, and I know that Tony, um, the president of the chamber has sent it out to, to their con his constituency. Um, so for anybody who cares, the, the, if this is getting in the hands of small business, this information here in Rye. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I su suspect that we have many who would like to speak about their experiences in Ida, and uh, we're going to uh, go through the list. We have a th three-minute convention, and the ability for people who don't finish what they say to, uh, out of courtesy to their fellows, to go to the, the back of the line and wait to come around again. If you simply want to ask questions, then I'd ask you to get all your questions out at once. And if we are able to answer uh, them, then we will. And uh, if not, uh, then there may need to be later discussion, um, either in a later public session or privately, however works best. Okay. Chris, do, do we have a queue? We have a, a few hands that are raised. Suki Van Dyke is the first. Suki. Go and mute yourself. There you go. Hi. Thanks, guys. Um, I just have a question because it's something that I didn't see on Greg's excellent list of action items. Um, one of the problems that we had here in Ida and in Omri and, and other storms um, on Milton Point is we don't have reliable cell service. And I know I've brought this up several times before. So what happens is everybody here relies on running their um, their cell service through their um, Wi-Fi. So if I want to make a cell phone call, if the power is down, I have to go stand in the middle of Dearborn. And when you've got this great idea for all of this terrific um, communications with people, we can't get it. And we've been asking, I know groups have been asking 
uh, for years uh, to find a way to get us cell service. And I would hope that that would be part of the infrastructure things that you're looking at, because it is something that is desperately needed here. Our 911 calls go to Long Island um, from the point and then get rooted back here. And if our government is going to communicate with us in this way, you have to get us service. Thank you. Thank you, Suki. It is something that we're working on. I'm hopeful that things will improve for at least part of Milton Point when the transmitters in the two tower building at Rye Town Park are turned on. Wish it had been um, at Memorial Day as promised, um, or even at Labor Day as promised, but that should come soon. It will not help all of Milton Point, and there's more to be done. Next, we have Zach. Yes, thank you. Um, most of what I heard has been around uh, discussing the Blind Brook and, and the issues and uh, potential to mitigate uh, future such storms. But I live by the uh, Beaver Swamp Brook, and not only did we have catastrophic flooding uh, during um, during Ida, but also during Henri. And I feel like two or three weekends before Henri, um, <laughs> our driveway floods, uh, you know, flooded, and even the Park Avenue bridge over the brook flooded. Sorry for the noise. Um, so I feel like this kind of thing is more of a low hanging fruit and it's the issue occurs much more frequently than some of the other issues, which are um, important, but might occur less frequently. So with nationwide attention to this area, I wonder if, um, you know, this is the right time to address this, um, this part of town as well. So my specific questions are, are there plans for um, Beaver Swamp Brook? and how to participate in any of the meetings that are um, being held with respect to this area and also how to stay up to date on anything that's being done specifically uh, with respect to this area. Thank you. Zach, could you just state your full name and address for the record? Uh, Zach Wolniansky, uh, 335 Park Avenue. Thank you. And... Kristen, you may, may be able to help us here. Beaver Swamp itself seems to fall into Harrison jurisdiction. Actually, our yeah, property that, boundary, that, uh, our boundary goes right through the middle of it. So there should be joint efforts with respect to that. Yes. In the, in the past, when Beaver Swamp Brook issues have come up, we have worked with with Harrison, so that would likely need to happen this time around as well. Next uh, speaker, please. There are no more hands raised at this time. If you'd like to speak, if you could just raise your hand. Here, Fraser Woodford. Thank you. This is uh, Fraser Woodford, 24 Low in Court. Uh, you know, I, I hear everything that's been said about the mitigation efforts and, and the cost of the various projects. Uh, I, I can't imagine the 3 million or 15 million or whatever the numbers have been talked about, that it would, be, would have been impossible for the city, the county, the state to find that amount of money over the last seven years. So clearly it's a lack of, of will, uh, of effort. And you know, we've heard the, uh, the various parties that, that may share some of the blame here, but going forward, how do we get this done? You've got a lot of residents that are quite ticked off, frankly, lost a lot of money, uh, lost a lot of possessions, a lot of sentimental possessions. So who do we need to put pressure on? What can the citizens here do to move this forward? Because, you know, coincidentally or not, you know, we finally got some, some movement here many, many years later. Let's not wait another seven years to, to get to the next stage. And then my second uh, question here is, it seems a right tradition to buy a, a house, tear it down, put two houses on that lot. Uh, there's also been a lot of other uh, development in the city. Uh, to what extent do you believe that has influenced our drainage problems here? 
and how will we think about that going forward as we uh, permit new construction? Thank you. I'll, I'll try to answer those actually questions that deserve really lengthy answers briefly. Um, the best, I, I think the best way to get something done is through our congressional delegation. That is, uh, the core has evaluated us on its own for one level of project. There is the possibility, the core has told us, of seeking greater funding through congressional authorization. And we have reached out to our entire congressional delegation to open those talks, but it wouldn't hurt a bit for Rye residents to be letting their congressional delegation know, and that's Congressman Bowman and our Senators Schumer and Gillibrand, uh, know that uh, the residents of Rye are expecting more help from the federal government than we've been able to see so far. And mind you, it, it was Senator Gillibrand who did help us two years ago uh, with an introduction to the core. And uh, it's Senator Gillibrand's rep who has actually toured Blind Brook uh, from uh, uh, so from Indian Village down, down to Milton Harbor. So it, it's, it's not as if there has been inattention. And as Catherine Parker pointed out, uh, Congressman Bowman did come and visit with us a week ago and is aware of what's gone on here. So uh, I, I hope that that's helpful, um, at least as a response to, to your first question. Second question, it's my personal belief that we uh, need to look at limitations on development, additional limitations on development, um, how we as a council go forward with that is something that we intend to take up. Um, that of course is, a, that, that, that will be an, how can I put it? That that will be an interesting discussion with, I think, many different points of view. Mayor, if I could say, I could summarize three projects that could be done. One with state help at SUNY Purchase, if we can get a piece of land there to put a detention pond up there on vacant land they have right now, we could put pressure with the new governor there. That would be great. And with our congressional delegation, we could put pressure to put a big dig on the Bowman, upper Bowman Dam um, pond, which is non-existent. It's not a pond. It's a forest. It's been uh, it's been disregarded. It's been left to just grow uh, for forever. And it, we know in combination with the uh, bigger big dig, we call it, and a sluice gate programming, we can mitigate for about a, a almost a foot of water coming down high to Highland Road from the dam. So those are concrete projects and concrete ideas, and we need to put just money, uh, you know, money to work. And, and, and that's what we need to do. And those are the, the, the projects. I'm sorry, I don't have anything on the beaver swamp. Um, I will do a little bit more digging on that. Do we have any more speakers? Yes, we have several. Uh, Sue Druin. Sue? Hi. Hello. Yes. Go ahead. The city of Rye needs to take action to insist on getting a seat at the table on what happens upstream on the Blind Brook. From what we heard from legislature, it appears that we have pretty much no control or even monitoring access to the Bowman Avenue Dam. We must insist on collaboration between munis municipalities, the county, and the state. Second, Rye needs to drastically rethink our building codes. 
We need stricter controls on our building permits. It is irresponsible, negligent, and reckless to allow overdevelopment the way that you have. Certain developers abuse our codes. They rip out trees. They excavate into bedrock, and they've been doing it for far too long here in Rye. These very developers who let our kids clean up their debris from Rye Nature Center, they have also overbuilt in flood-prone areas like Locust Avenue. Thank you, Mayor, for saying we need to additional limitations on development. The time has come, and you now have a mandate. Thank you to Council Member Goddard for mentioning green infrastructure. My home is across the street from a wetland, and we did not because, despite its name, it is a giant sponge. A plan to protect and restore our wetlands and wetland buffers is desperately needed to slow down and sequester. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Genevieve Weber. Weber. Hi, this is actually Ken Gilmore, Genevieve's husband. Can you hear me? 50 yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Hi. Ken, we can't hear you now. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. So there's a creek that runs directly behind our house and it goes to Playland Parkway and crosses under Playland Parkway through two tubes that are about 24 inches in diameter. Those tubes were overwhelmed. They couldn't handle the volume of water that was coming down behind them and Playland Parkway acts as a dam and blocks that water from crossing over to the other side where we go through the nursery field and then the cemetery out to the Long Island Sound. There was a third tube I go down there and I inspect them, uh, which looks like it collapsed inside quite a while ago. Um, so now there's literally two 24-inch tubes that are supposed to handle all that water that was sitting on Playland, I'm on Midland Avenue and the lake behind our house, which is typically a stream. Uh, is anybody looking into that mitigation there, or is that a, a county property because it's Playland Parkway? It, it is it is county uh, it is county right of way and county property, but we I will certainly make note of that and we'll add it to the list of things we're going to talk to the county about. And before I go on that same point, after Henri, they, the new path that they put along Playland Parkway, they cut down a, a number of trees and they left giant piles of logs right next to these tubes that could float and clog these tubes upon a storm. And that was in between the two storms. So I don't know if it happened because the backup we had was something that I've been here 12 years. I've never seen anything like it. My house was surrounded by water on three sides. That's Thank it. You. Next we have Joseph Donnelly. Can you hear me? Yes, Joseph. Uh, my wife and I have lived next to Rye Golf Club for 35 years. We've been members of the club during that period. Uh, and we've already written to uh, the mayor and, and several council members about the proposed renovation of holes four through six which would entail uh, removing at least 70 or 80 trees, if not more, and, and the piping over a stream. Um, the rationale of the club, the goal of the club in doing this is described as, quote, improving the golfer experience. And it would, uh, it would result in the holes getting a little shorter and perhaps easier for some golfers. Uh, but we think compared to uh, the potential environmental damage uh, that's not a sufficient uh, rationale, especially given the million dollar price tag. Uh, several homes on Allendale were uh, flooded uh, in, in uh, Hurricane Ida, um, and uh, one had up to nine feet of water. But there is a, we've, we've, we've explained that in letters to, to you, 
But there is a matter that I think requires more urgent attention, and that is the current tree removal program of uh, the Rye Golf Club. We heard the buzz saws going uh, last Monday when the club was closed. One of the neighbors uh, contacted Mayor Cohn, who was kind enough to get in touch with the club. And they said, this is routine maintenance. There are some trees that have ash borer or disease. Uh, there were some trees that were damaged by the storm. And that's all that they were doing. So we followed up and asked the club to send us a list of the trees that uh, were su supposedly slated for routine maintenance. Uh, and they did send us, uh, they sent us two items. They are requests for proposals 21-01 and 21-02 which I assume perhaps the city manager has. Uh, and they contain scores and scores of trees. Proposal 21 or request for proposal 2102 has 49 trees on it. And one of the items, one of the line items refers to 75 separate trees. So potentially 120 trees slated for routine maintenance removal. Just, just not plausible in our view. Just the other uh, request for proposal 2101 does apply to other holes, not just uh, the uh, holes four and five near Allendale. Um, and it does list a description of why these trees are slated for removal. Uh, there are 41 trees on that list, and only 13 of them are described uh, as having a problem like ash borer disease or uh, having been struck by lightning or something like that. Um, the total number of ash trees uh, on these lists is quite small. So, so we have in front of us uh, two requests for proposals that are being described as routine maintenance, which seem uh, to, to be the first steps in this renovation project. And I, I know the city has a code and the code has provisions on tree removal and they apply to both public and private property. And I know the city has a, a tree manager and I think it's important that the tree manager get involved in this process and make objective assessments uh, about whether these trees need to be removed. It just doesn't seem plausible to me that, <clears throat> that there are up to 120 tr trees that suddenly require routine maintenance. So that is one, one item I would ask the, the council and the mayor to, to look into. And the second, uh, it, I think Mayor Cohn has already addressed this, there, there were simply no minutes for Rye Golf Club throughout the year uh, 2020. So the origins of this proposal on holes four through six is, is a mystery. Uh, and, and we really need to have shed some light on how this uh, proposal came to be. Thank you. Uh, Joseph, thank you. As, as I think I've explained to, to you, um, the Golf Club mistakenly thought that during the period that they were in virtual meetings previously, they didn't need to prepare written minutes, and those minutes are being prepared. And it's my understanding that the Golf Club will is reviewing the minutes and will be passing them at its public sessions in October. Uh, ben? You might comment on that. Do I have that right? I believe that's correct. Yes, I, I, I know they're going back to uh, to rectify that. And um, again, you know, they thought uh, I believe because the club thought that or knew that the uh, the sessions were uh, videotaped that that sufficed for minutes. But uh, since that's not the case, they're going to go back and rectify it. The next speaker. Mr. Mayor, we don't have anyone else who has raised their hand. Anyone else would like to speak? If you could raise your hand. Okay, well, thanks to everyone who did speak and all who have listened. I'm sure we'll have questions from people through email or otherwise over the course of the next few days. And... Well, we look, we look forward to making progress with this just incredibly awful and pressing problem. So I don't know how others on the council feel, but 
Uh, we're an hour and 40 minutes into the public session. Maybe take a 10 minute break before we go on. Sure. Okay. So thank you. We will. May I have a motion to adjourn for 10? I'll make that motion. I'll, I'll Sarah. I'll Sarah second. I'll second Sarah. <laughs> See you all soon. Thank you. We're back in session. Uh, next is the CapEx update.